praise God. Tonight <laughs> is a special night that we've planned. Uh, we want you to be able to hear from some of our leader group. So tonight you're going to have seven chances for a miracle. Let me read a scripture. It says, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So we have treasure in this earthen vessel. And so I want you to make sure you pull the treasure out of the earthen vessels here at Houston Faith Church. Amen. Because we're giving for one another, right? So tonight what's going to happen is we're going to have a seven on seven. And that means that we're going to have seven speakers, each have seven minutes to tell you what's on their heart from the Lord. Now, they didn't, they didn't have a topic given to them. They chose something from their heart, and they've come to not prepare. They've come to let their heart out. So tonight, it's a seven on seven, and we're calling it the heart of our leaders. Y'all ready to begin? Are y'all ready? I want you to open up your hearts really big. I want you to open up your hearts really big. Listen. In any moment, you ask, you ask the Lord, Lord, what is it I'm supposed to hear? What is it I'm supposed to receive? In this moment right here, something of revelation, something of God can change your life, impact your life, help your life. Are y'all ready for that? Just lift your hands to heaven, Father. We come right now in the holy, mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ. Father, we know that here tonight in this service, in this seven on seven, you have something for us. Father, we know that you want to speak to us, that you want to reveal things to us, that you want to share things with us, tell us things. And so, Father, tonight we say that our ears are open to hear, Father, what you would say. So go beyond even what is physically said, Lord, that you would minister powerfully to each and every heart here tonight. And everybody said, Amen. say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Say, I'm open. I'm, open. I'm getting something. Look at your neighbor and say, and it's going to be good. All right, tonight, our first speaker is Miss Elaine Dean. From the message, 1 Peter 2, 9, 10. But you are chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instrument to do his work and speak out for him to tell others of the night and day difference he has made for you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Ephesians 2.10, we have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. There is purpose for your life, and God has planned your destiny and the good works you will do to fulfill it. Father came up with the plan. Jesus purchased the material, and Holy Spirit has been given the blueprint, and he has the equipment for you to fulfill your purpose. So what is your purpose? You are the hand and feet of Jesus upon the earth. You are anointed and chosen to be the very expression of Jesus. You reflect Jesus in your lifestyle. You are obedient to the word and you follow Jesus wholeheartedly. You are committed and serve under the grace you are placed in. And there is unlimited grace and that's God's ability and favor for you to fulfill your purpose. Now is the time to be all in with God to the fullness. And how can we be all in? It starts with developing your relationship with Holy Spirit. So we practice listening to increase our ability to hear him. And God can communicate in any way that we'll understand and we'll recognize. And it could be a still small voice, a leading, an unction. So we take every thought captive. We take what we hear and we align it to the God's character, 
God is kind and he is good. He never shames nor he does he condemn. So whatever we focus on grows within us. And what grows within us, we become. So we have been invited into this life that Christ lived. So what we do, we guard our ear gates and our eye gates. We pull away from things and people that pull our distraction away from time in the word and from his presence. We spend time worshiping the Lord with praise and thanksgiving. We spend time in prayer. Uh, So we are uh, people of his presence. And prayer is a place where we choose to go. So we pray and and we study the word. And um, let's see where I'm at. (laughs) We groom, okay, we spend time in his prayer and the word to build our relationship, to be groomed in his presence, and to become more sensitive to Holy Spirit. We have been given resources and tools, but it takes us cooperating with the Holy Spirit to use them. So we host the presence of God. And how we spend our, our time and, the, and things we choose, it matters. And the only one that keep you from fulfilling your destiny, the plan of God for your life, is you. So take a leap of faith. Step out of your comfort zone and walk in your assignment. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 28, he talked about how all authority was given to him. And then later he said, go therefore. Well, that is for us today. Disciples are people who commit their mind and their hearts to the thinking and, oops, sorry, the thinking and conduct of the Master Jesus. As disciples, we extend the authority given to us over situations and we spread the gospel. So it starts with each of us first stepping into being a disciple and then we make disciples. And we anchor ourselves in the Word of God with the presence of God and in prayer. So let's connect with God's vision and not waste time listening to the lies of the enemy. We're here for a purpose and we're fully equipped to fulfill that purpose. So let's not allow ourselves to be blended into the world, but to be different, to be the light in the darkness. So I wanna share a vision from the Lord. Late one night I was driving home and there was lights coming from this big building And the only reason it grabbed my attention was because the lights were so bright. And I didn't think too much about it until I was sitting in corporate prayer and Holy Spirit brought it to my attention. And then I heard these words, Houston Faith Church will shine brighter than any natural light you've ever seen. My question is, do you want to shine bright for Jesus? In the vision, you who are committed to the call are the bright ones. So let this be a challenge to push beyond our self-imposed limitations, excuses, and agree with God's plan. So let's just agree with the word of God that we are handpicked, chosen, and fully equipped to fulfill our destiny. We are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. You have a purpose. Purpose. Praise the Lord. Our next speaker is Mike Sobolski. If you have your Bible... Uh, Open up to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Have you all ever, uh, when you were kids, uh, gotten called into the principal's office? Uh, When I was in fifth grade, that was my first time. I needed correction. How about when you got older, you got called into the boss's office? Has anybody ever had that? Let me one-up all of you. I was called into God's office. Let me tell you what happened. About 20 years ago... I was taken up to the, I was taken up to heaven and uh, it was a wonderful experience. And the church I was at, there was a pastor and I told him about that experience. About two weeks later, three weeks later, uh, there was a service and a lot of us were on the floor out under the Holy Ghost. And um, I was just getting up and the pastor's making a beeline for me. And I'm thinking, "Ah, I know what he's going to do. He's going to lay hands on me and I'm going to go down again. Uh, But he didn't. He came up to me and he said, you have another appointment in heaven. Well, that's something you don't hear much. Um, So that night we went home, the wife and the kids went upstairs to bed and I went down, I was downstairs and I prayed and I was taken to heaven. And uh, this time I started at the base of the holy hill. There's a big hill in heaven where God 
his throne is at the top. It's a giant, giant hill. At the top one-third of the hill is a bright, 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 bright cloud. Um, so I'm at the base of the hill, and I start walking up some stone steps, and I get to the edge of the cloud, and there's a tree on my right-hand side, a small tree, and there's fruit on it, and God said, eat the fruit. So I take the fruit, and it looks like a pear, looks just like a pear, but you could see inside. And inside, there's a spiral red filament, a spiral red filament inside it. And I took and I ate it. And the, the second I did that, there is a hand stretching out of the cloud. And I said, Lord, whose hand is that? And he goes, that's your angels. And um, I took it. And uh, the second that I took that hand, I was kneeling before God. So you say, Mike, were you face to face with God? I was face to knee with God. Uh, and I got up there and there was just four words, just four words he said to me. I came all the way up there so he could say four words. And it was, read Ephesians 6.6. 6. So let's read Ephesians 6.6. 6. Kind of got your curiosity up? <laughs> All right. I'm reading out of the King James. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. I was taken up there to be corrected because when I would be at work, my boss would be around and I would be one way and then he'd be away and I'd be another way. And that was wrong. And I was corrected. I was wrong what I did. He had to take me to heaven and personally tell me to get right. I didn't judge myself. You're supposed to judge yourself. I knew. I was a Christian then, and I knew better. I knew better, but I did it anyway. I can just tell you right now, you can look at my stomach. I, I gained about eight pounds in the last two months, and that's because when tough things would happen, I would say, no, Holy Ghost, I won't take your comfort. I'm going to take the comfort of food. I reject the word of God's comfort, and I'll take the comfort of food. And that's a sin, and that's wrong. I needed to judge myself. I've stopped doing that. But that was wrong what I did. I wrote uh, uh, an email to uh, Pastor Joni and, and said, you know, uh, during the morning prayer meetings, I'm not given, a lot of times I'm not given, sometimes I am, but a lot of times I'm not given 100%. You know, in a prayer meeting, your spirit, soul, and body should be totally into it. Um, but we need to judge ourselves. Uh, Charles Finney was a great evangelist. He was responsible for the second great awakening. And he wrote um, about that Christians should judge themselves. And he wrote several things that we should judge. And I want to read them for you. Judge yourself with ingratitude, how you're not been grateful to God. Judge yourself with neglect of the Bible. Neglect of prayer. Neglect of church services. Judge yourself. Judge yourself in the manner that you do your duties. Judge yourselves in want of love for your fellow man. If you've been coming to this church for any length of time, Pastor Chaz has pounded you with that you need to witness for Christ. If there's some gospel tracts out there. If you haven't had a chance to witness for the Lord and you're not doing anything and you miss up on those gospel tracts and you just walk right by them, you're a fool. You're a sinner. Wait, I may have offended somebody. Let me go back. Let me, let me restate that. You're a stupid sinner. You're a big fool. Your number one goal in life is to get born again. Your number two goal in life is to get other people born again. Right? Here's some more things to judge yourself on. Judge yourself on neglect of family duties. Watchfulness over your own life. Watchfulness over your brothers. You know, we could, we could go ahead in here and we could delegate and, and legislate love, but it really is up to each of us to organically look at each, see who's around here and help those people. Neglect of self-denial. That's a big one. My, my morning prayer meetings I've been pretty sparsely attended. It, it takes a little bit of loss of sleep. 
Worldly mindedness, worldly mindedness. There's like 8,000 things we could talk about, but judge yourself on worldly mindedness. Envy, lying, hypocrisy, money, bad temper. Judge yourself, least you be judged. Praise the Lord, God loves us. And because he loves us, he corrects us. And that makes us smile because he corrects us to perfect us and to make us better. Amen. Patrick McGraw. I want to talk to you guys tonight about uh, how to expect the supernatural when you pray. Okay. Um, I want to tell you a few things about uh, of something that's happened in my family's life. And uh, here's how it kind of goes. It, it's like, when people watch your life, um, they should see something in you that, that sparks their interest. That's right. So like if something, let's say, let's, let's say it's about people's needs, like they need something in their life, maybe it's something uh, drastic like a healing. Let's say it's healing. Okay, when people watch your life, that you, they ought to be able to see, uh, I think he might have something for me. There's something, the way he lives, there's something, uh, I don't know what it exactly is, but I have this need. And so uh, what I want to say tonight is uh, this is what happened in, in my, my mom's life, okay? And it started back when uh, she had a problem with her dog and her little dog. She, she loved that dog. Uh, she called me on the phone one night, just, I mean, just, just, just freaking out, freaking out. She says, my dog fell down the stairs. He's screaming his head off. I don't know what to do. Can you come over? And so I hurried up and I went over to the house and uh, there's the dog on the stairs. This dog, the dog was still on the stairs. And I said, mom, I said, I will pray for this dog under one condition. And that is that when I speak to this dog's leg, I said that you cannot say anything contrary to what I say. And I, cause I was believing God that when I said something, it was going to happen. And I, and so I, I think people kind of do that about me, that if I, if I say something, I really mean it. And anyway, so um, I say, okay, you believe that? You, you agree with me? She said, yes. And I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And that dog jumped up that second and took off, completely healed. Okay, so that's kind of a cool thing, right? It's like, wow, it's a dog. You, you, know, you don't think that that would happen to your dog. But, you know, God cares about little things in our lives. Even our little family pets, right? They're, they're family, right? Okay, well, this many, a couple years later, uh, same dog. She lives on a farm, okay? And uh, the dog was out in the field, and they have donkeys. And he was getting too close to the donkeys, and they were yelling, Pierre, get away from that. Get away, get away. And then the next second, the mule, full kick right in the face. Full force kick on the face to the dog. Um, my mom called me in hysterics. My brother called me and said, look, we're going to take the dog to the thing, but I want to let you know that that dog is going to have to be put down. I said, his snout is hanging from his mouth, right? And he's just in bad shape. And so I went down there and I talked to my mom. And I said, uh, and, the, and the vet came in and said, uh, yeah, we, we can take him in. It'll be about uh, $3,000 just to look at him. And then I said, Mom, do you have $3,000? She said, no. She said, I don't have $3,000. I said, the best thing we can do is just believe God for this dog. We went home, and um, this is the same scenario. This is, a, what, uh, 10 o'clock at night now. I, I say, Mom, I will pray for this dog under one condition that whatever I say, you cannot say anything different. And she said, okay. And I just pointed at the dog. I said, be healed in Jesus' name. And I said, I got to go because I'm tired. So I went home. The next day, the dog is completely healed. His snout is back together. He's eating. And he lived for another, you know, five years or something. You know, and that was, so that was kind of wild. That's again, that's a dog. Okay, a dog. Now, my mom got cancer a very deadly cancer, and um, it's, it was stage four when they found it, and it would looked bad because it's a, a type of cancer that is not curable in the natural. When you get it, you die. 
And anyway, so we believed God, and I, I said, Mom, we have a healing service. I said, you got to go. you got to go to this healing service. She came to the healing service, went down to the front, got prayed for, felt the power of God. And, uh, and then uh, that Wednesday, she started chemo. Okay, so she went through uh, eight rounds of chemo. Uh, she went to the doctor, and they did take out uh, a part of her, of her liver. But here's the cool thing, is that whenever the doctor said, hey, uh, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to take 60% of your liver. But when he got in, he only had to take 25. <laughs> the tumor had shrunk from this to this. So it was like this miraculous thing that, that they, they did to her. So uh, the bottom line is, after all that was over, uh, she was completely healed. The cancer never came back. My mom is still alive and well, doing very well. And God completely healed her. She's been back three times to, the, to, the, to MD Anderson to do the check, and she is 100% clean. So what I want to tell you tonight is that when people see you, they should, they should know that you have an answer from them. We have Jesus inside us. We have the healer inside us. We have the power and the authority of Jesus himself. He said you would lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so if you believe that you, and, you, and you speak it, you don't take it back. You don't take it back. So, you know, just to let you know, if God, listen, if God will heal a dog, a dog, how much more will he not heal his children who are worth so much more? What did he say? He said, uh, he, said uh, he knows if us one sparrow falls, how much more does your heavenly father know? care about you. So I just want to say tonight, let your light shine to people. Let them know that you have something that they need. If they need something, they should be able to come up and say, hey, you know what? Um, would you pray for me? I, I, I'm, 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 I'm in trouble. And you can say, yes, you know, don't, you don't have to do the thing I did, like under one condition. <laughs> if, if I say this, you have to agree with me. So anyway, but yes, you should, you should have that, do, you know, bulldog determination that when you see somebody sick that you can go up and say in the name of Jesus I command that thing off of you and it has to obey you okay praise God come on every believer is supernatural come on we got supernatural life right on the inside of us we have the answer and you got to believe it when you pray expect it when you speak expect it are you ready, Mr. Fela Dodd? Right. I'm going to first start out by saying this. If you're looking for excellency in the kingdom of God, look no further than Jesus Christ himself. Amen. So we have many heroes in the faith. Like I love John G. Lake. I love Smith Wigglesworth. There's Amy Simple McPherson, there's T.L. Osborne, there's Daisy Osborne. But if you want to learn the kingdom, look at Jesus. Amen. Look at the words of Jesus, look at the life of Jesus, Amen. look at the miracles of Jesus, and you have all you need. Amen. That's the gospel of the kingdom. And so I want to talk about something that distinguished Jesus from everybody else. The people, they looked at Jesus, they heard him, and they said, he's got something different than everybody else. All those other scholars, those scribes, they talk and they just talk, and they just talk. They're good ideas, but they fall on deaf ears. It wasn't changing anybody, but just something about Jesus. He had something on him, it's called authority. Every time he spoke, it was like a weight that was behind his words and it affected change. Whether he was teaching, whether he was healing someone, whether he was praying, there's like, there's something on him. What is that? That word's called authority. He knew it. There's something that happened to him when he encountered God. I believe it happened in the wilderness. I believe it happened at this baptism. He understood, I have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's right. He's given me something and I have something to give. He probably knew it from when he was a kid. But if you want to walk in that authority, if you want to exercise that authority, if you want people to notice and you want the devil to notice, you have to know it yourself. Amen. And so that authority was so strong on him, not only the people did they notice, the demons noticed. He didn't have to address them. He just started teaching. He just started talking and they started freaking out. They're like, what are you doing here? You would have thought he was the boogeyman. They were so scared. They're like, oh, oh, what are you doing here? Are you messing up the party? He's like, exactly. I came to mess up the party. That's what I do. Because he has authority. 
he has something that the world didn't have. And so when he showed up, they knew something was different and they were scared. They were absolutely terrified of what he had on them. So I want to talk about how we get this authority and exercising this authority. And that authority is available today. I want you to know when you say something, it can happen. When you speak, the devil takes notice. Even God takes notice. Yes. Amen. Mark 11, 23 and 24. We love those scriptures. So yes. Jesus said, you know, if you believe, if you can speak without doubting, that mountain will move. Therefore, anything that you ask, believing, you will receive. I thought that was interesting. It's like he talks about speaking to the mountain. If you believe it without doubting, it will happen. Therefore, if you pray, why the therefore? Well, because if you can believe that whatever you say will happen, just speaking to a thing, he said, God gives you that same attention. So a mountain's going to listen to you. A thing will listen to you. Jesus spoke to a fig tree. He said, y'all can do the same thing. But notice that God pays the same type of attention to what you say. He hears you and he immediately, he's like, whoa, that's my child speaking. What's up? What's going on? And so in Psalms, it says, the Lord's ear is open to the righteous and he hears their cry. I got a, there was a time where I was meditating on that, you know, meditating on righteousness and how that affects our prayer life. And so I was meditating on that. I could just see the father looking at his children praying. And he's just like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Telling the angels like, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm going to listen to everything that they have to say. And when I when I put my hand down, then you can go get it. And so he's just like waiting, waiting, waiting. All right, there we go. Do it now. And that's the kind of attention that he gives you. That's the rest, you know, the earth listens to you because you're an heir in Christ Jesus. You inherit the earth. The earth is your inheritance. But even God listens to you with the same intention. Why? Because he put you on this earth to exercise his plan. Amen. All right. Amen. So let's go ahead to, uh, let's go with Luke 7. All right. So we know about the centurion. He came. His servant was sick. He said he's severely tormented. But, you know, Jesus is like, I can go and heal him. Like, come on, let's go. And he's like, you don't even have to come under my roof. I'm not worthy of that. Only speak the word. Why? Because I'm a man under authority. And so, therefore, he's saying, I, I, you know, I can say something to somebody and they'll go ahead and do it. But I recognize you have something of the same. You say stuff and things happen. Right. He says, I'm under authority. And I'm thinking, OK, why would he say he's under authority? What's that got to do with anything? I would I would think, oh, he has authority. Why don't you just say he has authority? No, he's like, no, I'm a man under authority. Why? Because the authority you have that you have is bigger than you. All right. You're backed by a heavenly kingdom. There's some law. There's law that backs you up. There's law that says when this person speaks, I expect you to do what they say. Right. right? And so it works whether you feel like it or not. The name of Jesus works whether you feel like it or not. Whether you're discouraged or depressed or whether you're sick yourself. All you have to do is believe it. It's not about how you feel. It's not about if you're angry or sad. It's not even about if you prayed 30 minutes. I've seen it work without me praying. I've slacked off a couple of days, but I needed a miracle. And what happened? It happened. Right? Because that authority is real. That authority is constant. God never changes. We may change, but he never changes, and that law never changes. And so, let's go ahead to uh, Colossians 2.15. Actually, this is, this is what we're going to end with right here. Here we go. And so, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, some say principalities and powers, and put them to open shame by trying, triumphing over them in it right and so what basically saying so he whipped the devil and took all of his power away Hallelujah. went ahead and put him in a chokehold and told him you can't touch anybody else right and so he's that the devil is that weak he's been rendered that helpless so he said all right i'm going to put my my foot on the devil and i want you to come by and kick him i want you all to take turns you all come by one by one give him a good kick and that's what he left you here for. You're thinking, okay, you know, life is so hard and terrible. Sometimes it's, it's weird and ridiculous. But honestly, the reason why you're here is to exercise that authority and show the world what Jesus did. Right. He says, all right, I want you to get in on this. All right, I whipped them already, but I want you to get a good hit in. So go ahead, take a swing.
Praise the Lord. Come on, take a swing. Take a swing. Praise the Lord. All right. It's good stuff. You ready, Brother David? David McCuller. Yes, ma'am. We're going to talk about obedience. Obedience to the Holy Spirit. We all know that the Holy Spirit is our helper. And without, the, without our helper, we are nothing. So important that we listen to the Holy Spirit. So important that when we, whatever we go through in life, that we vet everything, every decision, every movement, every step we take, it's got to be through the Holy Spirit. The testimony I want to share has to do with years ago when my youngest son, Jalen, was born. Um, my wife and I went to, uh, went to a family member's house, and we had a nice time at the house, and we had a discussion. And throughout that discussion, uh, the topic of their piano came up. And this family member had mentioned that I want to sell this piano. So I, I said, hey, how much you want to sell it for? Well, the family member said, well, to you guys, I'll give it to you for free. And so I looked at my wife and said, wow, we'll have a brand new piano, nice piano that we can have in our household. Immediately, the Holy Spirit spoke extremely loud and said, no, do not take this piano. Do not bring it inside this house. And it, it took me by surprise. And I looked at my wife and I said, no, I still need to bring this piano. You know, it, it's free. So <laughs> we need a piano in our house. <laughs> so, so I said, Holy Spirit, we'll talk later. <laughs> but I need, to, I need to take this, this piano with me. <laughs> so I told the family member, don't get rid of it. I'll pick it up tomorrow. So I hired a moving company to go get the piano. We put it in our living room and we celebrated. You know, here we had this piano and we were all excited and it's nice and shiny and pretty. And so that night, Jalen, he was, had been about six months old, but that night Jalen screamed to the top of his lungs, almost like somebody was strangling him. Chris and I ran in that room, grabbed that baby, and, you know, consoled him. Immediately he stopped screaming, so he laid with us. Then we said, okay, something must go on, or something must be going wrong, let me put him back in the bed. So we put him back in the bed, immediately started screaming, as if somebody was strangling his throat. So we grabbed him back, took him to sleep with us, and this went on for about five or six days, back and forth, and we still couldn't figure out what in the world is going on. Well, about six days later, I had a deep dream. Holy Spirit gave me a dream that was so, 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 so real, it was one of those kind of real dreams. And immediately I woke up and Holy Spirit put the word piano in my face. And in milliseconds, the only way I can describe it is in milliseconds, not seconds, but milliseconds, he gave me the description of I was disobedient, I didn't listen, I told you not to, uh, I, you brought this piano in here, uh, you know, all of this instruction, he said, get rid of this piano immediately, this morning. Mind you, it said milliseconds. I can't describe what a millisecond is, but I knew what it felt like. I woke Kristen up, it was about 2.30 in the morning, I said, Chris, get up, get up. <laughs> I said, God spoke to me, told me I was disobedient, this and that and the other, and, and just, I, I should have listened to him. And I said, I got to get rid of this piano immediately. And so, ironically, what happened was after the piano, the move, I hired a moving company come bring it. When that moving company came, we discovered that the piano was right underneath Jalen's room, which was which was which was something. I said, "Wow, this is this is odd." So when the moving company came and picked, took the piano, uh, the the guys moved it out of our house, and the Holy Spirit told me, "Tell these guys to burn it." Don't sell it. They're going to try to sell it, but burn it. And this time I heard them loud and clear. I, said, I went over to the guy and I said, look, sir, I don't know if you believe in the Holy Spirit, but I'm telling you what he said. The Holy Spirit told me to tell you, remove this piano and burn it. And the guy, and he, and he told me that you would sell it and, not, and, not, and do whatever you're going to do with it. So immediately the guy said, karma, man, karma. I'm going to go ahead and burn it like you said, dude. <laughs> So, 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 so the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, look, you would not have gone through all of this unless you listened to me the first time. 
And there's two lessons that I learned out of this situation. Number one, you have to actively listen to the Holy Spirit and be obedient and do what he says immediately. Don't wait until he has to scream at you because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He can speak to you softly, loudly, but when he tells you to do something, do it immediately. The second thing I learned out of that is don't bring everything in your house. Not every gift is something you need to receive. Vet it through the Holy Spirit. You know, just because you, you get this sparkly item or whatever it is, make sure that it is vetted through the Spirit. So those two lessons I learned through that, through that experience. I'll talk to you. I read, about, uh, read a story in Pastor Chaz's book, The God Why. And he talks about this, this pastor. So if you haven't read this book, please read it. I encourage you to read it and get it in the bookstore. But this pastor, very similar situation. He disobeyed God. God told him to uh, stay in his hotel. He decided to leave. When he left, he had all his possessions stolen. Same thing. Make sure that when the Holy Spirit tells you something, follow it and do it. John chapter 14, 23 says, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and make our home with him. You want to make God your home. Have him your home. Obey his word. Follow his word. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in everything you do at work, when you're driving, when you're making a decision to buy something, when you're having a communication, when you're driving. Talk to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper perpetually 24-7 for every single thing we do. We don't put them on the back burner just because we go to church or it's our prayer time. Holy Spirit is supposed to be every part of our life. I encourage you to make sure you do that. That's why he's here. Thank you. He is our helper. Best helper ever. Best helper ever. Miss Karina McKeever. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, no good thing does he withhold from us. And then in a different part of the Bible, it calls us his little flock. And every time I think about that, it fills my heart with so much joy and so much love that he calls me his little flock. He is my shepherd, his rod and his staff guide and protect me. He loves me. He watches over me tenderly. And there's no good thing that he would withhold from me, and that includes healing. Um, and so many times we think that we're standing in faith, believing God for something, um, for a miracle, a healing, for him to answer a prayer, but it really is a head faith. So we know the scripture. We know, yeah, in theory, God can heal. You know, the Bible says that I hear it. He does miracles, um, but is yet to grasp us in our heart. And so we, you know, we struggle when situations come against us. If our body, you know, doesn't feel right, um, you know, we struggle with it. We question it. We wonder about it. Or maybe we're not seeing what we think we should be seeing. And then the reason that we struggle with it is because the truth, the truth of what he says, right? His word doesn't lie. It was true yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It will never change. It's the truth. It trumps my situation. It trumps what I'm feeling. That truth is yet to be bigger in me, bigger than my situation, bigger than the circumstance that I'm going through. Um, so... When we're believing for something, whether it's for healing, for our finances, or a miracle, we need to have a heart faith. So not a faith that's from your head, but when it moves from your head to your faith, I'm sorry, when it moves from your head to your heart, that it's a heart faith. A faith that believes and receives the answer to your prayer the moment you release your faith for it. So faith is in the now. I believe that I have it now. I receive it now. I don't wait for my situation to change. I don't wait for my body to feel different. I don't wait for a tangible something. You know, when I release my faith in the moment, in the now, is when I know that, um, that I have it, that I receive it. So a heart faith says that I have it now. I speak to my body. I tell it to line up to the word of God. I say, body, you will submit yourself to the word of God. And so I walk in that. Um, you know, and so as I read the Bible, as I listen to sermons, as I hear teachings, my heart fills with faith. The Bible says that as we hear the word, the word of God, that, you know, we get faith. But as we learn in kids' church, as we teach the kids, faith without works is dead. And so that's the sign we do for dead for the kids. Um, so we have to put an action to it. So my heart faith, when I'm listening to the word of God, it fills up in my heart, but then I have to have an action to it. I have to release it. I have to 
proclaim it. I have to declare it. I have to act it out. Um, so my heart faith, when I release it, I believe and I trust in God that when I speak it out, my prayer is answered, and so I don't have to wait for my situation to change. I don't have to wait for my body to feel fine. I believe it when I release it. So a few years ago, I had an MRI, and when I had the MRI, they found that I had growths in my thyroid. Um, and so the doctor said they were benign, that I didn't have to really worry about it at the time, but just to keep an eye on it. So if it changed, if I started to have pain or experience discomfort when I would eat or drink, then that would be concerning. If I felt a growth, if anything changed, that I was to come back to the doctor right away. Um, so a few years passed by, you know, and I was fine. They just kind of kept an eye on it. About a year ago, I woke up with a sore throat. And so every time I swallowed, it would hurt. Every time I would eat, it would hurt. And this went on for a few days, and I just thought, you know, maybe it's just a sore throat. It's going to go. Um, but after a couple of weeks, it just get getting progressively worse. So every time I ate, every time I swallowed, I could, it would hurt. Um, and then on the right side, I can feel a lump. So I had a lump in my throat. Um, and so once I realized, like, okay, like, this is pretty serious, you know, what do I do? Um, you know, immediately the devil came to me with a lie. You know, and the lie he said is, you know, this is pretty serious. You're probably going to need surgery. You're probably going to need radiation. You should probably go to the doctor right away. So in that moment, I had to make a decision. Do I succumb to this lie? Or do I choose the truth, the word of God that's bigger than my situation, that is the truth? Um, and so I said, no, devil, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Body, you are well. It is well with me. Um, and so for a couple of weeks, you know, I just meditated on his word. I heard healing services, whatever I could grab, my hands, books. Um, and so my heart just, you know, began to fill with faith. I didn't quite feel ready to just release it yet. So I just kind of sought the Lord, you know, quietly on my own for a couple of weeks, just filling my heart with faith. And one morning I woke up and I woke up and I just had the assurance that I knew that I knew today is the day. Today is the day I will release my faith. Today is the day that I will get my miracle. And it happened to be a Wednesday. And I said, that's it. So my heart was just open, and I said, that's it. I'm getting my healing today. Today is my healing. And all day long, I work. I'm like, okay, I'm going to church tonight. Body, you're getting healed tonight. Body, you're going to be well. You're well. And so I came to church excited. My heart was open. My expectation was all the way up that any moment, at any moment, by anybody or anything, anything can happen, right? So I come. I sit down. Pastor Chas was preaching. The whole time he's preaching, he's not talking about healing, I don't remember what he talked about. Um, then my heart was like, yes, at any moment. I'm just waiting. I'm waiting. Is something going to happen? I'm just waiting to receive because it's going to happen. Um, and he finished preaching, and he closed the book as he does every service. He closed the book. And as soon as he closed the book, in my spirit, I knew something had changed. Nothing tangible had happened. Nothing he had done. But I just knew in that moment that the power of God was there to heal. And so I raised my hands, immediately closed my eyes, and I didn't care who was looking. I didn't care what was happening. I said, God, this is my moment, and so I thank you. And I began to speak to my body, and I released my faith. And then right after that, pastor started speaking in tongues, and he had an interpretation. And so he started calling out healings, and he called out, you know, different things. He didn't call out my sickness, but I said, God, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he calls me out or not. It doesn't matter if he lays hands on me. The power of God is here to heal. If he will heal someone else, he's not a respecter of people. If he will heal her, he will heal me. If he heals him, he's going to heal me. And so in my spirit, like the woman with the issue of blood who pushed through and wouldn't let go, I said, God, in the spirit, I am holding on. I am holding on and I am pushing through till I get my miracle. I am not letting go. Um, and so that was it. And then I didn't feel anything different. I didn't feel anything tangible. And so I just praised the Lord for about two minutes. I just kept giving him thanks for doing it. Um, and I, my throat still hurt, but by the end of service, my lump was gone and all pain was gone, and he healed me. Praise God. Woo! It's all true. Everything God said is true. Everything God said is true. You believe that everything God said is Absolutely. true? It's Jovan Harvey. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. I like the NIV version. It says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. 
that sounds kind of important. Sounds really important, actually. And it is very important. It's so important that we guard our hearts because our hearts is where we love God. Our hearts is where we love people. It is with our heart that we believe and are born again. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, you will be saved. The word of God is planted in our hearts. It's not planted in our mind. The real faith is of the heart. Real revelation is of the heart. And Romans 5, 5 says the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So if we haven't been guarding our hearts very well, it can be harder to love God, love people, and see miracles. And there are many things that we need to guard our hearts against. Bitterness, unforgiveness, pride, doubt, double-mindedness. But tonight, I want to focus on discouragement and disappointment. 1 Samuel 30. So David and his men, they're away, and they come back to their city. 1 Samuel 30. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziglag, attacked Ziglag, and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but they carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Whew. Wow. Imagine coming home to your city and that's happening. Now, the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. So on the scale of pretty disappointing and discouraging things, I'd say that is pretty high on the list. But what did David do? But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. The King James Version says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. We see it in the Psalms. David was constantly reminding himself who God was, what God had done for him. He sang songs of praise in the midst of battles. He told his soul what to do and what to say. Psalm 103, 1 through 5, bless the Lord, O my soul, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not, forget not. Sometimes that's the first thing that we do whenever we run into a discouragement or a disappointment. We forget, but but we must be quick to do what David did. We must be quick to encourage ourselves in the Lord by immediately speaking the word, immediately. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Hey, soul, hey, 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 forget not. He forgives all your iniquities. Hey, he, he heals all your diseases. You hear that? It's here. It says it. He forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from destruction. What are we doing whenever we're talking to ourselves, when we're telling ourselves, and when we're speaking the word? We're stirring up hope within ourselves. We're stirring up hope, and when we stir up hope within ourselves, faith has something to work with. And did you know that faith, that hope, hope has an attitude. Hope is confident. Hope is joyful. Hope has expectation. An example of confident hope would be Abraham. Romans 4.18, Abraham. See, Abraham, contrary to hope and hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. Why did Abraham become the father of many nations? Because even when there was, was no reason for hope, he kept hoping. Even when that discouragement and that disappointment came and those years passed and those years passed and they kept on passing and they kept on passing and they kept going and they kept going, still, he believed. He believed. And he believed because God made him a promise. God gave him a word. And he believed in that word. And he held tight to that word. You know, discouragement's job is to steal your confidence. Disappointment's job is to steal your hope. Don't let it have a place, not for a second. Second, you speak the word and you stir up hope within yourself. Hope is the antidote to discouragement and disappointment. Hope is the antidote and we always have a supply because the hope comes from the word. God is the God of hope. His word is hope. We have a supply. It's in the word and it never runs dry. We have a supply and our supply never runs dry. So, You guard your heart from discouragement and disappointment by encouraging yourself in the Lord and stirring up hope.
Another way that we can guard our hearts against disappointment and discouragement is to be strong and wait for the Lord. Psalm 27, 13, 14. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he, sh- and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Don't let your disappointment be because you ran ahead of God. You know, sometimes we, we will run so far ahead of God and we'll get all the way over here and we'll run into that disappointment and that discouraging thing and we'll be like, God, where are you? Well, God is back there waiting for you to partner with him, waiting for you to believe in him, waiting for him to work it out with the Holy Spirit, what it is you should even be hoping for working out with the Holy Spirit, waiting for you to listen, waiting for you to grab hold of a promise and put your faith into it. So guard yourself, guard your disappointment, and discourage, guard yourself from discouragement and disappointment by being strong and waiting on the Lord. Another way that we can guard against discouragement and disappointment is to consider Christ. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. When all else fails, consider what he did, what he purchased for you. Eternal life, salvation is enough. You know, Pastor Joni, when she did her fire series, she said one of the logs that keeps our fire burning is the joy of salvation. The joy of sal- salvation is enough. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, I want you to put a scripture up for me, please. Uh, put uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, verse 39, we're going to, excuse me, verse 49, we're going to start 49 through 51. I just felt like of the Lord that I should, we should tack on something. You know, faith does have action. Amen. We've heard a lot of good things tonight. Whatever sits your heart tonight, you need to go home, re-listen, re-meditate on it and do some things with it so that it can produce the life that's necessary. It can have the intended purpose, the intent. It can accomplish fully what God has for you in you hearing that and knowing that. But I just want to just for briefly for a moment talk to you about disappointment and discouragement because it's something that everybody deals with. Everybody, no, no matter how long we live in the earth, uh, we're going to have the, um, the temptation. I'm going to call it a temptation because really if we take disappointment, it's a sin. To disappoint is to, is to not, uh, it's to lose our appointment in God. And our appointment is our appointment in hope. And to be discouraged is to come out of being, uh, having courage, which we're to always have courage. So if we're discouraged, really we're in sin. See, this is kind of like the thing where Dave was talking about. Like, I'm sure when the Holy Spirit said that, Dave didn't really say, Holy Spirit, I'll talk to you later. Just in his heart, he was kind of, he was kind of trying to balance his desire versus what he felt like the Holy Spirit was telling him. And so the, the feeling to get discouraged or the feeling to get disappointed comes to you. And instantly on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit is saying, no. Don't, don't do it. Don't go there. Reject it. Rejoice. Be thankful. Come on. Think about what God has done. Use your authority. Use your faith. Do something opposite. But what we're doing is thinking about how we feel. And so we have a choice in that moment. And really discouragement will, it, it disconnects you from the flow of heaven disappointment disconnects you from the flow of heaven. It's not that God doesn't love us, but in that moment, he can't flow. He can't work through that. He can't even come really and do whatever's necessary to get you out of that because you've allowed yourself to get into discouragement or disappointment. We can't do it. Listen, if we're going to be remnant people, if we're going to be kingdom people, if we're going to live fully today in a crazy, this world has gone cray, 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 cray.
But we're going to have to stay with our hope in God. We're going to have to take courage in every situation, even if it didn't turn out exactly this time like I thought or like I wanted. I don't know. I'm going to take courage. I'm going to be encouraged because I know that God is still God. Come on, that God will work me through it. Come on, that he'll turn everything around and make it good for me. But that's, that's what we have to have that attitude to get to that. And so I just want to remind you of something very quickly. I feel like tonight I just want to put a little action A little faith in us making sure that we don't have any discouragements or disappointments. So back in uh, Mark, is it Mark? No, it's Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus was training his disciples. We're disciples, and Jesus is still training us. He was training them some things about uh, living in the kingdom of God. And he was telling them about, if you go into a city, uh, you know, present yourself, ask if it's a son of peace when you go into the house, see if they'll receive you. And if so, then love them, bless them, heal them, help them. But he said, if they don't receive you, do y'all remember this? This is the words of Jesus. He said, if they don't receive you, you're going to have to go outside. And basically, he said, shake the dust off. Shake the dust off of what just happened. Whatever, you, whatever happened that you didn't like wasn't the thing that you were expecting or you were wanting. You're going to have to shake that off. That's what Jesus told them to do. So then we see here in Acts chapter 13, do you have that scripture up? Acts chapter 13, they actually got the chance to do this. And the word of the Lord was uh, spreading throughout all the region. So they had gone into a city. They were preaching the gospel, preaching the kingdom, sharing the word. Verse 50, but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. In other words, Paul and Barnabas went with a God assignment, knowing what they were called to do, knowing what Jesus wanted them to do. They got there and then it wasn't received. In other words, it didn't go like they wanted. Maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but when that's what you're called to do, when you've picked up and gone into another city, with an assignment from God, with something from God's word, just like you taking a promise and you've got God's word and now you've got into it and it doesn't quite look like or it hasn't worked out like what you think. That's what happened to them here. So what they wanted wasn't what they, what, what they were getting. In other words, God's will wasn't being done here. The promise that they were going to go into the city and preach the kingdom to everybody and everybody was going to receive Jesus, that wasn't what happened. People were being stirred up. They were expelling them. But look what verse 51 says. Thank God they remembered the words of Jesus. What they did not do was go sit down and get sad and say, well, I thought that the Lord had told me to do this. And it didn't work. God just never works things out for me. And just begin to doubt and begin to murmur and can begin to complain and begin to forget everything that God had done in all the other cities before that. See, that's what we do. We get a promise. We get a destination, we get an expectation, and then when it doesn't work out quite like we want, we go sit down and we start just, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't work for me. It's only, I don't know why so-and-so can pray, but it doesn't work. We We just let those feelings and the thoughts and the doubts and the devil get right there on the inside of us and mess with us. But look what they did. It said, no, but they shook off the dust. They went outside the city and they knew right there they had a choice. I can get discouraged. I can get disappointed or I can do what Jesus said. I can shake the dust off. And it said, as they shook the dust off from their feet and came to Iconium, then 52, look at this. And then the Holy Spirit uh, and then the disciples were filled. They shook the dust off and then they were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. It didn't say while they were down and out and thinking, why isn't this working, that God poured himself down on them and joy began to shake them and rumble them about. No, no, no. It was as they stood against, they shook off discouragement and they shook off disappointment and they said, I'm not taking it. I'm not having it. I know who God is. I know what God, what he said he'll do. I'm going to maintain my place in God. And as they did that, they were filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. We sit like this, Lord, this just so, Lord, if I could just have some joy. No, 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 get up and shake off the discouragement. Shake off the disappointment. Shake it off. Get up right now. We're going to shake off every, jo- every discouragement and every disappointment about anything that you can think of. I want you to shake it off. I want you to get radical with it. Shake it off right now. Shake it off. Take it off. 
and fill your heart up with hope. Come on, fill your heart up with courage. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Shake it off. Shake it off. We shake it off. And we're filled with the Holy Spirit and joy. We're filled with the joy of the Lord. We know that God is good. That God is for me. That God is never against me. That God will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. Glory to God, we know we have the victory. Glory to God, we know we have power and authority. Glory to God, we know the devil is behind us. He's under our feet. Glory to God, we have it. We're healed, we're redeemed. Glory to God, we're prosperous. We have every need met. Glory to God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God, thank you, Lord. Shake it off. Now you have a choice right here. You might be thinking, this is really radical. It is. This is how, what Patrick said, people are going to see you got something different. Because when your head is held up high and you got a little sparkle in your eye, even when things aren't perfect, they're like, something's different. Something's different about them. So right now, you have a choice. You have a choice when you go home tonight to get in your car and say, that's it. I left all the dust. I left all the dirt, the disappointment, and the discouragement outside the church door. I left it in the parking lot. And it ain't coming home with me. And it ain't showing up in my uh, morning time when I roll out of bed. Praise God. Did you shake it off? Did you get it off? Did you laugh a little bit? Just smile a little bit. Just get happy in the Holy Ghost just a little bit. Glory to God. Glory to God, Pastor. Woo! Glory. And they were all filled with joy. Woo! And they were all filled with joy in the Holy Ghost. Come on, this is how faith people live. This is how faith people act. Come on, this is how faith people can make a church service alive. Did you know faith and Holy Ghost people can turn nothing out, turn something out of nothing? Every single day because we have access to the kingdom of God, we can turn nothing into something at any moment. You can turn boredom into glory any moment. You can turn words from a printed page into life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 